Jackson here for WrestlePopia Podcast Network, and I am very excited to announce that we have a brand new podcast coming up in August with the man himself, Dangerous Doug Gilbert. I am getting ready to have some dangerous conversations with this man right here, Doug Gilbert. Dangerous conversations. That's what it's all about. Hey, man. <laughs> there are a lot of friends of mine that I've got some stories to tell about, from even from my childhood growing up till today. Here in Jonesboro, Arkansas. That's right. We're going to cover the entire Gilbert legacy. You've had questions. You've wanted to know things about Doug, about Eddie, about Tommy, about the Gilbert family in general. And if you tune in to Dangerous Conversations with Doug Gilbert, we're going to be telling stories each and every week. And you never know who from Doug's past or present may be there with us. Join us. Wrestle Coffee Podcast Next Work. Dangerous Conversations with Dangerous Doug and, Gilbert. And there's going to be a lot of friends. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Retro Wrestling Review USWA podcast. I'm your host, Gene Jackson, and once again, I'm joined by my lovely co hosts, Josh Briley and Richard Mulliken of P3 Radio. Guys, how's it going? It's going it's awesome, pretty good. Man. Yeah, man, this is awesome. Glad, glad to be back. Hopefully, uh, we're not people aren't getting sick of us yet. <laughs> well, I mean, it's only the second week in a row. I mean, you yeah. Know. For an acquired taste, though, man. Like my grandmother used to tell me, you know, she was big on uh, hating Danny Davis and hating on pretty much me and my friends. <laughs> so we were in good company. So we were an acquired taste, according to her. That's, like, uh, that's yeah. upsetting. I don't know how you can hate on Danny Davis. I, don't I mean, know even, if, even if his nephew wasn't here with us right now, I still would be singing the praises of Nightmare Danny Davis. Yeah. Well, yep. Mamma wouldn't, and she'd do it right in front of me too. Yeah. <laughs> she looked right him, looked Josh right in the eye, and be like, "Your uncle wasn't shit." You know that? I ain't seen him win one match. Mm-mm. I'm like, "Well, well, well Miss Pearl, he has. He's got that one <laughs> belt. He won that by full fit." <laughs> <laughs> but she, to be fair, she's seen him like in the late '70s and the early '80s. You know what I mean? And like some of that time, he was getting stomped into you know a pile of nothing, but like. Over mm-hmm. time, he just went other places, and then he would go under a mask and this and that. So, like, Miss Pearl didn't know he was winning as a nightmare. Well, we're yeah. squirreling here. Long story short, we're doing good. <laughs> yeah, he got a hold of them Flintstone vitamins in the late 80s, yes. and things turned around for him. So, mm-hmm. uh, that was we're it. happy about that. So, all right, guys. So, uh, you're here. You're doing good. I'm here. I'm doing good. What do you say we head back to February 27th? 1993 for some more USWA championship wrestling. All right. So fresh off the narcissist Lex Luger coming into town last week and helping Brian Christopher pick up a disqualification win in a tag team match against the King Jerry Lawler and Jeff Jarrett. Of course, we talked about that at the end of last week's show, how uh, Lex managed to duck out of the way just in time with a fireball that the King tossed that went right into Brian Christopher's face. Uh, We're actually going to see that here in a little while, so uh, stick around for that. And if you are just listening on the audio, go to YouTube and find the video because you're going to want to see this. This is one of the biggest. I've seen Jerry Lawler throw some fireballs. Good Lord, this one is epic. So uh, as the show gets going this week, we get a recap of what's been happening with the Gilbert brothers in the past few weeks. You know, they've had a a war uh, raging on, and uh, we know from the end of last week's podcast that Last Monday night, Eddie defeated Doug via countout in their most recent one-on-one match. So Eddie comes out and uh, has some things to say about his brother Doug. Let's let's check out what Eddie has to say about Doug following their most recent match where he won via countout. Eddie, I'm sure you saw all of that, and uh, obviously you're uh, you're still not in too good a mood about it. Well, Dave, this has been a, a very very strange situation for me since the beginning. Uh, I know a lot of people probably said to you, a lot of people have said to me, to everyone around here, that uh, it's a little different. Two brothers uh, fighting each other, especially in the wrestling business. You don't ever hear of that. 
Well, then I got to thinking about this past week a little bit. Well, it's really not anything different. Because if we think back about a little bit, and it goes back to the Bible. Remember Cain and Abel? Well, I want to come out here today, and I want to tell my story about Doug Gilbert. I want to tell the story that hasn't been told. I want to tell everyone here what a goof my brother has been all of his life. All of a sudden, we heard this racket. Come watch me. Come watch me. Well, we come running outside the house. We run around the back of the house, look up on top of the house, and there's Doug standing up there with this big, long red cape on. He says, I'm Superman. I said, Doug, don't, don't. You can't fly. He said, yes, I can. And he jumped off, and Doug didn't fly. <laughs> uh, Doug went, boom, straight on his head. Well, it's Doug again. And now he's got him a little towel wrapped around his body down here, and he's going, oh. He says, I'm Tarzan, king of the apes. And he grabs us a little. It wasn't, even, it wasn't even a vine. It was just, I don't even know what it was. Hooked onto the tree. And he says, watch me swing. And he swung. <laughs> but Doug didn't make it. Doug went, meow, boom. Once again, right down on his head. He so, said, you know, let me try it. Let me try it. Let's have, a, let's have a wrestling match down here in the den on the carpet. And we would. And I'd wrestle around with him. And I'd say, ah, come on, leave me alone. No, no, come on. I can beat you. I know I can. I know I can. I said, no, leave me alone. And he'd keep on, Dave, the sooner or later I'd have to really bear down on him and I'd have to beat him. Well, Doug, I hope you're listening back there. I hope my family's listening. And I want all these people here and everyone at home to listen. It's time to bear down again. The last few weeks I've been in the ring with Doug, I've stood back just like I did those weeks whenever I didn't bear down on him. He's tried to get me to hit him. I haven't used my fist on him. And Dave, just like you and the rest of these people know, I am not in any popularity contest. I don't care whether people like me or don't like me. I don't care who I have to wrestle. But when it came to my brother, I didn't want to fight him. All right, guys, what do you think of that? You know, I was telling Josh, and I hope this doesn't come off the wrong way because I don't want it to. During that whole interview, and, you know, I was real young when this happened, and, you know, I, some things you don't remember and stuff that, you know, you don't remember certain cadences and everything. But if I was to close my eyes, there's so much similarities between that interview and like a Lawler interview, like the same kind of cadence, the same storytelling. You can definitely see that there was some influences from Lawler there. Uh, it was it was definitely an interview that you would hear Lawler do, you know, on, on Memphis TV. It was very calm, very, very precise about what he was going to do. But I was like, man, you know, this sounds like it could be a Lawler promo. Um but I, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm alone in that thinking, but just everything about it was just, if I closed my eyes and just kind of listened to it, I'd almost say that was Lawler, you know? Um, and, and it just goes to show, you know, like, like how good Eddie was, he could do that same thing. Lawler made money off of that same speech pattern, the same thing. Uh, but I, I thought the interview was really good. You know, it, it was, you know, a very baby face interview uh, that uh, told a story. You know, we didn't have to be in the living. We could we could exactly know exactly what happened in the Gilbert household with him and his brother just from that story. We knew twenty years of history, and that's anybody one thing, with a sibling could relate to that. Yes, that's yeah. one thing about Eddie too, man. Like when he was a he was a bad guy, a heel. Like he was the worst of the worst. You yeah. absolutely hated him. Nothing was off the table. But when he was a, a baby face, good guy, whatever you want to call it, you could hear like the fans like in the crowd, he's telling the jokes and they're legitly laughing, yeah. you know, yeah. and a lot of times that does not translate and people just will eat you alive, especially for trying to make a joke or trying to get a laugh or something. But Eddie was always good with that. Even you'll see coming up like he's doing that when he gets in the ring during the match too. like he's just. He was in a yeah. really good mood that day because yeah. he was extreme <laughs> crowd work, having fun. And man, no matter good guy, bad guy, he was tip top. I guess, I guess what I want to say is I don't want to say that he was copying Lawler. I was saying you could probably tell the influence that Lawler had on him for, for stuff. Like that. I didn't want it to come off. Like I was well, like, no, oh, it's, or so. it's well documented that Eddie Gilbert was heavily, heavily influenced by Jerry Lawler. Um, you know, outside of his father, Tommy Gilbert, it's, it's been, I mean, yeah. Eddie has said it himself over the years that, you know, he looked up to Jerry Lawler. He was a fan of Jerry Lawler and he patterned a lot of what he did 
after Jerry Lawler. In fact, I've heard uh, Dutch Mantell say in interviews that Eddie, in his mind, patterned himself after two people, Jerry the King Lawler and Terry Funk. And he said, depending on what night it was, he could stand back here in the dressing room door and he could watch Eddie have a spot on Jerry Lawler match or a spot on Terry Funk match, depending on either what mood Eddie was in or, uh, you know, what the situation called for. So I don't think you're out of, uh, yeah. out of line making that comparison at all. And I don't think, you know, Eddie Gilbert would argue that. Um, I thought he did a really good job with this promo here. Cause like I said, anybody with a sibling, whether you're the younger or the older sibling, you could relate to this promo. Uh, but I thought it was well delivered, uh, to Josh's point, you know, when he told the stories, the crowd laughed, and they went with him on the story. But then when he got to the serious part of the, the promo where he said, you know, time to bear down, which I liked that phrasing of it, you know, because, you know, me as the older brother, you know, my little brother was nine years younger than me. And we like to watch wrestling and, and UFC and things like that. And he would want to wrestle around and, and he would get he'd get out of hand. And, you know, I know that exact phrase. All right, it's time to bear down. It's time to shut this shit down. And that's what we <laughs> and that's what you would do, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's funny. My wife was in the room when I was watching this for the podcast and she was listening and she knows I'm getting ready to start doing this uh, podcast with Doug Gilbert. And she's like, so I have a question I'd like to submit to the podcast. Ask Doug if those are true stories. Did he really, did he really <laughs> jump off the house and try to fly like Superman and did he swing out of the tree? So uh, I'll be I'll be submitting those questions from Rose Jackson for Doug for the Dangerous <laughs> Conversations podcast. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, man, I I'll thought this was a good promo. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> that would like, be the perfect response give, if he does. Give him the smartening up to let him know that it was your wife that asked that offline, so he doesn't just yeah. go on into a tirade. <laughs> so that is the Listen. question. <laughs> Listen, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want to get like all power pro cheat promo on my, yeah. on my old lady. So uh, yeah, you may be right. I might need to. I might need to let him know where that one came from. But <laughs> as uh, as Eddie's wrapping up this promo, you start to hear some familiar music starting to play in the background. Is I'm too sexy by right said Fred starts playing and uh, bless your heart folks. If you're younger and, and you weren't around in the nineties uh, and don't remember that song. Uh, I'm sorry was... to cut you off Gene, but do, do you think though, because like they literally started playing the song probably what 15 seconds before Eddie got done with the promo. Do you think that that was a way of them saying, Hey, hurry this Wrap shit up. up. Oh yeah. Without, That's like yeah. getting the hook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. you could kind of you could kind of see it in Eddie's face, like because mm -hmm. he was trying to bat. It, he still had more point to get to, but you could see like right there at the end, you could see like, ah, eh, I've had enough of this shit. I'm just gonna get done with it. And <laughs> you could see he was kind of like, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. I I, I I meant to point that out, but I'm glad you did because yeah, there definitely was an element of that. Like somebody in the back's like, all right, he's still going. Just hit the music, and <laughs> he did redshirt on his face like. Oh, that's what we're doing. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you think okay, the uh, somebody in the WMC area got a little nervous because there's a they were getting to that point in the song where Rhett Wright said Fred says, uh, "Oh, pussy, <laughs> pussy cat." <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, Eddie, wrap it up. We've got two seconds for he's going to hit that line. And they're <laughs> shoving <laughs> Brian through the curtain back there, like, go, 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 get out there, get out there. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So, so as that music starts playing and Eddie wraps up the promo, here comes uh, Burt Prentice leading out the Southern Heavyweight Champion Brian Christopher, whose face is bandaged up like the Phantom of the Opera due to this big fireball he caught last Monday night for the King. And uh, <laughs> I have to say, in theory, uh, I'm more excited for this match on television than yeah. perhaps any match we've seen. I mean, we've talked about it here before, like. You know, we've had a lot of fun watching these shows. There's been a lot of great angles and, and some memorable stuff, but not in the way of matches. Uh, there haven't been a lot of great matches. Most of them have been squash matches, and the ones that weren't squash matches, there wasn't a lot to them. So when I realized, like, hey, we're getting hot stuff Eddie Gilbert against Brian Christopher in the opening match here today, I was pretty si excited about it. How about you guys? Oh, yep. man, I, I could not wait. And and I don't recall ever seeing those guys, you know, wrestle each other a lot. Maybe 
from this before this point, I don't remember it at all. I mean, I could have missed a show mm-hmm. or something, but yeah, it was like it's one of those I've never seen this before. Yeah. This is going to be extremely exciting. Well, you know, they announced it at the beginning of the show, and I was thinking, okay, well, you know, this is probably the main event. Yeah, and then like you hear the music playing, and Brian comes out there, and I'm like, they're doing this now, <laughs> like. They're opening the show. Like, who's going to follow this? Because, like yeah. you said, this was this is a main event type match that didn't happen a lot. And then, especially um, with these two in the roles, ever. And I think down the line, you probably saw some heel Eddie Gilbert versus babyface Brian Christopher yeah. matches in, you know, 94 and, mm-hmm. you know, like that. But to see heel Brian against babyface Eddie was definitely an added uh, bonus in my mind. So, Let's uh let's hear some clips from the match and uh, we'll talk about it a little more on the other side. Just arriving. Brian Christopher. He's got Bert Prentice behind him. He's gonna be in his corner. Brian wearing a bandage over his eye for confidence. Let me tell you that. He's going against a tough one here today. The veteran, hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert, a man who's wrestled all over the world. And as he said a few minutes ago, he's not going to back up from his brother, and he's sure not going to back up from Brian Christopher either. Referee Paul Neighbors has signal for the bell, and Corey, we're underway. This should be a good one. Yes, sir, Dave. We are underway with a big day in store for USWA Championship Wrestling. I don't think that trick's going to work. Puts his head out. Eddie well, shakes Eddie, his hand, yeah. Yeah, Eddie does shake his hand, and, uh, and Brian didn't try to nail him with a fist either. There's a surprise. Let me tell you, I thought Brian would try to smack him. Gilbert and Brian Christopher. Christopher backs him up against the turnbuckle. Oh, oh he acts like he was going to give him a clean break. Oh, oh. There's the hot stuff strut from Eddie Gilbert. Gilbert backs Christopher up against the turnbuckle. Remember, Paul Neighbor gives him the break. And look at Christopher. Comes out with a big blind forearm in there. Christopher comes off. What a right hand. And boy, he goes to work on hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert. Yeah. Oh, oh good right. move. Good move from Eddie to slingshot him off the rail. Oh, boy. A one count, and Doug Gilbert comes and jumps in the thing. Would you believe it? Gilbert jumping on his brother, Eddie Gilbert. Looked like Eddie had Brian Christopher set up for the win there. Look at Doug Gilbert pounding Eddie Gilbert. I'm sure he heard what Eddie had to say a few moments ago and didn't take kindly to it. And now it's two against one. Bert Prentice over here celebrating. Yeah, Prentice, you ought to get him out of there. Doug Gilbert and Brian Christopher double teaming. Hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert in there. And Doug, boy, makes you think he's just gone berserk. Let me tell they you. got him tied up in a rope. I'm sitting out here listening to people talk about teaching me something. Daddy, I can see. I can dance. Look at it. You can't teach somebody something that knows everything. I said I'm the king of rock. All right. We're going to come back to that in a moment. There's, there's another little piece of that. But so, you know, we're trying not to be overly critical of things here, but so it's no surprise we've definitely yep. we definitely have a regular program of having the person the baby face is in an angle with running in on the finish of the match so right on cue eddie hits the hot shot which i was disappointed that dave or Corey seemed to know that's what that move was called uh, <laughs> but he hits the hot shot on brian seemingly the match is over so doug hits the ring breaks up the pin for the dq uh they do a little bit of double teaming before doug takes the opportunity to go give his response to eddie's promo while brian continues to attack eddie um yeah. I, I, I know you guys have got to be as frustrated. I mean, I understand that the the Saturday morning show only serves to be a commercial to get you right. to come to the Monday night matches. But damn, can we have a competitive match between two people that has some sort of finish without somebody running in? I mean, it's it's crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, why not use a, utilize a count out or something there, you know? Doug come out, Eddie chases him off, gets counted out. Well, he's way out. But yeah, I mean, when I saw immediately when I saw that they were the opening match, I was like, oh, this is because Doug's going to come in. Like, 
even as a kid, I think I could have called that. Like, and I understand point. this match lends itself to that finish, but had you not already done it for every competitive right. match you've had in the last, you know, in 93 so far that we've covered, um, you know, it just, it's frustrating. It's like, God, I mean, it's like none of the, none of these matches are going to mean anything. They're mm-hmm. simply just to give these guys an opportunity to screw each other back and forth to set up Monday night's match. But up until then, it was a fun match. I enjoyed yeah. it. Um, and like I said, there's the, the ending was never really in doubt. Uh, Josh, what do you think about the, these front end finishes every week? I'm not a fan, but you know, I think we've seen what out of all of these reviews, maybe at the most two clean match finishes, maybe three. At I mean, are most. you are you including squash that, matches that, or yes, that, that's yes. including everything? <laughs> yeah, I exactly. think it's about up to two or three, but yeah. you know. Uh, I do enjoy the brother versus brother thing, but oh, yeah. like you're saying, it, it, if they hadn't done it so many times, uh, yeah, I, as a kid and as a viewer, just trying to view this through the casual lens again, you know, like I'm a complete fan, I am frustrated. You know, it's like, God damn, again? You know, but <laughs> maybe, maybe this coming Monday, is the big blow off. Maybe it's going to be it and they're going to move on to bigger and better things. But what, what do you hate more? These clean, these unclean finishes are the Harris brothers. Oh, Harris brothers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then the the double whammy, the double whammy is when the Harris brothers runs in and then it's just, which is like like 90% of this show. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it ain't over with yet, pal. No, no. Um, So uh, as, as, Brian is working over Eddie. Doug's over on the microphone uh, talking to, to Dave Brown. And Jeff Jarrett runs in to make the save. But unlike the usual thing where the babyface makes a save, initially Brian cuts Jeff Jarrett off. And uh, Brian starts getting a little bit in on Brian. On, uh, I mean, Jeff starts getting a little bit in on Brian. But as that happens, Eddie unties himself from the ropes and he just kind of disappears off screen. <laughs> and uh, we hear Doug talking and then all of a sudden this happens. Hey, hey. Oh, Jeff, Jeff, stick your nose into my business and you look at your brains be out too pumped. Look at him, Dave. It looks real good, Doug. Hey, I had him tied up over in the ropes over there at two against one. He's about to kill Jeff, Jeff, Dave. Now look at this. He's about to, hey, the boy. Oh, Eddie Gibbard just tackled Doug over here. Got him on the floor. Well, Eddie Gibbard came from nowhere, Dave. He got loose from the ropes, and all of a sudden I looked up, and here's Eddie Gilbert flying through the air at Doug Gilbert. Here's Eddie trying to get him separated. Jeff is over to help out. We'll get him apart. We'll be back with more from the USWA. You stay with us. My favorite part of that is you see Brian get out of the ring, and go jogging in that direction. You think, oh, he's on his way to save Doug. No, he blows right past him. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie Marlin and Jeff has to pull Eddie off of Doug. <laughs> what about what about Doug? Like uh, Doug sold that so well. Like oh, yeah. the little brother that's pinned down. He was doing that kick and like, go <laughs> get off of me, get off. dude. That I thought was ingenious because they are painting the picture of Doug being the little brother that's getting yep. a little bit too big for his britches. I loved it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we, we needed Tommy Gilbert there in the role of Eddie Marlin pulling Eddie off of Doug because I assume that's probably how that played out at home a few times over the years back when, you know, Doug was a little smart-ass kid. But, yeah, they've played this, you know, they've played this perfectly so far. So, uh, good match. Like I said, I think that finish worked for that match. It just sucks that we've seen it so many times leading yeah. into it. But we're not going to harp on that. Uh, but, you know, um, as per the usual, uh, they do things a little backwards. You know, we saw uh, Brian come through the curtain with his face bandaged up. And now after that first match of seeing him wrestle with the bandaged face, now we're going to see how he got the bandaged face. So uh, let's take a look. Last Monday night, the Mid-South Coliseum, the big tag team match, Brian Christopher and the narcissist Lex Luger against Jeff Jarrett and Jerry the King Lawler. Christopher gets a tag on Luger and Jeff. The king. Step comes out. And look at Jerry Lawler. Left and right and send Luger down. Now it's Christopher. Everybody. 
God is in there. Jared whoops Christopher into the rope. Picks him up and drops him down face first. <laughs> what a move from Jeff Jarrett. Slams Christopher into the turnbuckle. Hey, Jared Lawler's got Lex Luger, and he falls, draws the narcissist. Lawler, Paul draws Luger over there, and the King says, wait just one minute, though. Lawler looks like he may have fire in there. rather, the King Jerry Lawler burns fine Christopher in there as Luger, Lex Luger, tried to get out of the way, oh boy, and it all breaks loose. Bruce Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, jump on Lawler and Jared, along with Lex Luger, and they jump on downtown Bruno too. This kind of stuff broke up. Bruce Brothers, Ron and Don Harris, Bert Brennan, and Mike Sample. Now there's there's a couple of things to talk about there, but first let's let's take a look at step by step the progression of this fireball right here. So there's there's where it starts. There's wearing goals, both of them, it looks like. <laughs> and then there it is. Jeez. Surrounding Brian's face. Wow. <laughs> That's not the big thing that stood out to me. I want to see if you guys drew the same assumption I did. So uh, before I follow up on that statement, just tell me what you guys both think uh, coming out of that clip. So the one thing we were talking about during that clip was – it felt like the Bruise Brothers were trying to snap Bruno's leg, and Lawler kept like grabbing the leg, like trying to grab him and saying, "Stop! These blows are not going to be believable because you should be able to snap Bruno's leg with this chair, and he's got to walk Saturday morning. So you're not going to snap his leg. <laughs> Stop doing it." And yeah, the first time I watched this clip, I thought, "Okay." So after watching the Harris brothers pinpoint Bruno's legs. <laughs> I assumed that he would come crawling into the studio, dragging his legs behind him like Rick James yeah. after the Murphy brothers got a hold of him <laughs> back in the day. Uh, but that's not how this played out. Is it? Um, mm -hmm. Bruno's perfectly fine. So that felt weird because I mean, not only did he beat his legs, but at one point he's taken the chair and just grinding it into his, his leg Whoa. right above the knee. And I was when like, we well, this watching, has got to be an angle to break Bruno's leg for some reason. Yeah. When we were watching that back, I just looked over at him and I said, that just hurts. Like, why <laughs> the fuck are they doing that? You know, like, and as soon as they started, I turned it. Why are they just instinctively going after his little ass legs? Yeah. Usually if you're in that position, it's like, work me over on the back or just something. But like, yeah. they just went to the front of his, the top of his legs. <laughs> they weren't. You know, do you think that they were supposed to look like they were trying to hurt his leg? And at the last minute, Lawler grabs the chair, kind of like when they put the chair around the ankle and they do the stomp. And in the last minute, right before they can do the stomp, somebody grabs the bad guy and beats him up and gets him out of there. Do you think they were trying to do that so they had an angle to bring in who they're going to bring in? And they just I mean, misheard? <laughs> I maybe, I mean, because. Uh... I remember thinking as I'm watching this, like over the years, I've only seen people hone in on a particular body part and work it over to that extent. If this was an angle to put him out of the territory, like, oh, he got his leg. Like, I remember at one point, I think one of the moon dogs or somebody years ago, they did. They were like, oh, they broke his leg and he's not, you know, the moon dogs are going to be gone for a while. And usually there was, you know, either they were going to come out in a wheelchair <laughs> 
or in a cast, or they were leaving the territory. But neither one of those things happened here. The only thing I can figure is Bruno is taking the same vitamins that makes Richard Lee's arm immune to all the chair <laughs> shots and stomping that he's taken the last few weeks. Cause you know, I've pointed out, you know, there's weeks where they've stretched his arm out and both Harris brothers, Mike samples and Burt Prentice have just stomped his arm into a fine powder. Not only did he not show up with his arm in a sling, he rolled out of the ring and cut a freaking promo <laughs> right. afterwards more than once. That's happened a couple of different times. So, I mean, I hate to say this, but stuff like this from the manager, and I love downtown Bruno, but stuff like this from the managers make the Harris brothers look like a couple of giant pussies right before we bring in this person we're about to bring in. And speaking of that, let's hear from, Bruno and Double J and the King and see exactly who they're bringing in this week to avenge Bruno's unbroken leg. <laughs> well, Jeff Jarrett and downtown Bruno have joined me here just as we wrap up the highlights of that. What a great crowd we got today. They are fired up today. You know, Dave, when I was watching that tape, when I, the first thing I thought when it came to my mind, I thought of the song Great Balls of Fire. I want to say a few words to Ron and Don Harris. I don't know if you guys realize it or not, but you've bought yourself some big problems. You know, I'm standing beside a big face right here, but the, and, and, and you are going to think that this man's face is this big that you're going to have to get in the ring with Monday night. Downtown Bruno got on the phone and called his big friend. That's right, the giant Gonzalez. Now, when I say big, I am talking big. I'm talking bigger than Andre the Giant, who was seven feet, four inches tall. Well, this giant Gonzalez is eight feet tall. Do you understand what I'm saying? Get done. Well, it's just like this. Like Jeff said, Brian Christopher has some friends in low places. But you see, Dave, I got some friends in high places. <laughs> I mean, way up there high. Because the giant Gonzalez has a hand bigger than my whole body. <laughs> The man wears a size 24 boot. This man is over eight foot tall, and he happens to be a real good friend of downtown Bruno's. I promise you this, there won't be nothing left of Brian Christopher, and I'm planning on leaving that Coliseum and going back home to Walls, Mississippi and telling everybody that they don't have to look at Brian Christopher anymore. And you know why? Because it's like mama says. It bees that way sometimes. <laughs> Jerry, we need you to get over to Lane Bryant and take a take a promo shot in front of that large Amazonian woman they have. The <laughs> That's all I could think was. So did Lawler just happen to be wherever that wall is and implement it into the promo, or did he go? We got to find somewhere where there's a giant <laughs> face on the wall where I can then compare it to Giant Gonzalez, but. It was a stretch. I mean, it's a woman's yeah. face, obviously, at like a beauty salon or like you say, Lane Bryant or God knows where. <laughs> You're going to think this man's face is as big as this woman's face on this wall beside me here. Like, <laughs> very <laughs> odd. But, yeah. you know, uh, so they have announced that the eight foot tall giant Gonzalez is going to be their partner, which it makes sense because, you know, he's associated with Bruno Harvey Whippleman, if you will, and the WWF. But now, for context, if, if we're watching this in real time in 1993, we only know Giant Gonzalez from being A, El Gigante in WCW, and I'm sure we're all hoping if we're USWA or WBF, let's hope they don't remember that. Um, otherwise, we only know him as this giant guy in this absurd-looking <laughs> airbrushed bodysuit. Mm. who showed up at the Royal Rumble and killed The Undertaker, as far as we know at this time. Um, and now he's just going to come in as the big baby face savior of our heroes, Jeff Jarrett, <laughs> Jerry Lawler, and downtown Bruno. What do you guys think of, of us bringing in the giant Gonzalez here? Dude, Memphis is the upside down, just like mm -hmm. on Stranger Things. No matter what, whatever it is at the big company, it is the opposite whenever it comes to Memphis. And even back then, I remember, well, he's a bad guy, but at least he's going to help Jerry and Jeff. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. that, that was the only thing. And Bruno's got control of him. So, you know, and 
you talking about we knew you know he was el gigante from the back in the day like i remember in real time back then he's not eight feet tall he's seven foot seven <laughs> that's what gary michael said you know what i mean yeah so like yeah. i knew they were exaggerating that but still you know he was gonna crush the harris brothers i can't wait well we but, know if the harris brothers can't break bruno's leg they're not <laughs> breaking his yeah. giant if you get hurt by a, a, a Ron or Don Harris chair shot, that's on you because you've done something wrong. Uh, my biggest thing about uh, L.A. Gante or Giant Gonzalez coming in, uh, as a kid, I think Memphis played on those um, Mason Dixon line, Southern Root type things where they were like, hey, New York is New York. They're crazy up there. So they're going to paint us in a picture to when we go up there, it's going to make me look like a bad guy, but I'm just telling them how it is and how those Yankees look at things is not the right way. So that was how <laughs> I always rationalized Lawler being a bad guy on TV, even though I knew that yeah. wasn't right. But, you know, at the same time, I'm like, well, that's how you do it. You know, he's John Gonzalez is bad up there, but he's fighting against those Yankee values, you know. So Argentina, you can't get more Southern than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so or he's one of us, one of us, one of us. <laughs> you know, you always hear those stories about the WWF, you know, creative department and everything. And it's like, I just imagine Vince McMahon seeing like a picture of El Gigante. And it's like, God damn, he doesn't have any muscles. We need to get him some muscles. And they're like, mm-hmm. What if we just airbrush some on a on a skin tone bodysuit? Because <laughs> you know the initial suit had all that hair, like like fur on yeah. the front. Of, eventually, the fur was even airbrushed on. But the initial suit that he's wearing at Royal Rumble, it's just he's got like <laughs> no genitalia, just a lot of fur in the front. And I was like, man, put some trunks, like uh, put some trunks over the bodysuit. Like that's nope. disturb this big huge man bush in the front of the suit. Is <laughs> I, I can't even see what he's doing to the Undertaker because I can't yeah. get past that. Yeah, you know? looking like a Playboy from the seventies out there. Yeah, just uh, all man. nothing but hair. <laughs> <laughs> can't even see nothing for all the hair. He got that giant bush because he's a giant. <laughs> yeah. But we see why he's so mad now. That's why he's out here trying yeah. to kill people. <laughs> All right, so the John Gonzalez is coming this Monday night. Right now, let's take our first podcast commercial break of the episode. And when we come back, we will hear from Brian and Christopher and friends. Hey guys, this is Wolfie D from PG-13. Check out my podcast, Live and in Color with Wolfie D every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis. We're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some Hall of Famers on the show with us every Monday at noon, Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling the podcast that's based on the old school but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise. This team does it all, and all they ask is, give me back my pro wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. This is Wrestling Nostalgia, the podcast that dives into wrestling history. Hey, wrestling fans, I'm Dave Dynasty. And if you enjoy podcasts that are knowledgeable and history-driven, then Wrestling Nostalgia is for you. With great guests and fun interviews, there are over 200 episodes in our archives. We chat with several first-time guests and often cover topics not discussed on other podcasts. Look up Wrestling Nostalgia on your favorite podcast platform and visit all of our links at linktree slash WrestlePod. That is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash R-A-S-S-L-E-P-O-D. And remember, wherever you go, what do you do? Be good, be safe, and keep on growing. All right, so when we come back from break, not only here, but on the actual television show, Burt Prentice, Brian Christopher, and the Bruise Brothers come out, and uh, Burt Prentice is pretty fired up in this promo. Uh, <laughs> not since uh, not since Bubba Johnson has he been this this mad in a promo recently. So 
let's hear what these guys have to say now that they know that they've got a giant problem coming. And I have to say, I forgot to mention it a moment ago, but my favorite line from all the promo from Jarrett Lawler and Bruno was uh, Bruno's line about they got friends in low places, but he's got friends in high places. Uh, that was pretty good. So, uh, <laughs> nice play on words there from, from Harvey. Let's you listen see- to what Brian and them have to say. You know, you bring out that tape of the giant Gonzalez like that's some big deal. Big Everybody deal. wants to tell. Well, of course he's going to do that to a flunky like The Undertaker. But do you understand, Monday night, you're not coming to Memphis to fight no Undertaker. You're coming to fight three of the meanest, most rotten human beings on God's green earth. And I guarantee you, when that giant gets in the ring Monday and sees these guys, I have a secret suspicion. He's going to put his tail between his legs and run out of the building, if you know what I mean. Well, I think you're This right here, this right here is why Jerry Lawler is not here today. It's because last Monday night at the Mid-South Coliseum, Jerry Lawler took a big fireball and threw it in my face. Me. Of all people, you had to burn me. You know, Dave, I don't know if I will be permanently scarred from this. I don't know if the skin will ever grow back the way it was before. But Jerry Lawler, I showed up today. I'm standing here in living color. I didn't stay at home. And another thing, I've come looking for you. They look at us, they look up, and they take a step back, and they say, good God, give them some big men. Bring in the eight-foot man. Stand him up against the two of us, and we'll just see how big and how bad and how nasty you are, Gonzalez. Well, the word from the Harris brothers and Brian Christopher and Bert Prentice. So, Burke's fired up and shitting yeah. on The Undertaker. What do you guys think of that? Oh, Dave, he looked kind of nervous, too. Oh, what? <laughs> he don't want to... Oh, come on, guys. Don't talk about The Undertaker. I mean, come down here and kick all my ass. He's pretty fired up, though. I mean, yes. like... Yes. That's a... That's a it's kind of like a baby face promo. Like Josh said, Memphis is the upside down. Like earlier, we watched the clip of Lawler throwing the fire. He had hit his power driver. There was no need to throw the fire. That's a heel move. And then, like, uh-huh. then you got Burt Prentice coming out there throwing one of those. I mean, that was very Paul E. Paul Heyman esque type promo that will get you fired up and going. It's like, yeah, you know, these big guys going to come in here and think they're going to kick us around. You're going to fight three of the meanest guys on God's green earth. And it's like, well, that's a football speech. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <sighs> yeah it, I'm glad you pointed that out too. Cause I, I meant to mention that I got sidetracked with the fireball and then the chair across the leg, uh, <laughs> you know, Lawler, I would have never guessed in a million years that Lawler was going to hit a pile driver on Lex Luger. Like that completely floored me when that happened. I was like, so we built up to having to throw the fireball because that was going to be the only offense he could really pull off on Luger because we painted a picture of how much he's going to be overwhelmed by the body of Lex Luger. And then now we're just going out there and pile drive him. And then now the, the fireball is just the icing on the cake. Yeah, uh, as a setup move, the power driver was a setup move <laughs> <laughs> to get him in position. That's crazy. Because let's not forget what they said before that. Match. I got to admit, Jeff, I am so impressed with this man's body. I'm going to break you open like a hot biscuit, boy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that's why Bert's so mad. Jeff didn't deliver on that promise. He didn't break anybody <laughs> open like a hot biscuit, boy. But uh, but yeah, I've never. I don't even even in his Bubba Johnson promos, he wasn't that fired up as he was. And the fact that he, like I say, the fact that he took a moment to dunk on the Undertaker <laughs> just felt yeah. so, you know, out of place. But am I uh, wrong no. here? After that promo, were the was the crowd not chanting Bruce Brothers? They were chanting, chanting something. I couldn't make it out. Bruce Brothers. It's like, did they just did Bert just work them into a? Yeah, you know what? They are underdogs in this. Well. 
and to that point as well, you know, Bert came off like a baby face. And then Brian's like, look at this. I took fire to the face and I'm here, Jerry Lawler. This is why yeah. you ain't here. So basically he's calling Lawler a coward and he had to go shoot a promo next to a wall somewhere. <laughs> undisclosed location in Memphis. But by God, he's here with his face burn yeah. off. The skin may never grow back, guys, even though he was able to put athletic tape directly on it. That yeah, seems uh, painful. <laughs> <laughs> seems like the worst way to heal your well, you face. know, I'm like no doctor. At least throw some neosporin on it or something. <laughs> Jesus, bro. During this time, though, athletic tape was the cure all. It yeah. was like if you got any kind of injury, just throw some tape on it. You're good to wrestle. Like that old Chris Rock joke. Put some Robitussin on it and some yeah, athletic tape. It. <laughs> that was the wrestling in tussie. Put that, that tussin soak in there, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the Harris brother gave, gave his same fired up yelling promo that he gives every week that neither inspires or impresses anyone. Hey, look at us and say we're big men. So bring an eight foot tall man in here and we're going to beat him up. Like, shut up. You couldn't break Bruno's leg with a steel chair. <laughs> right. He's going to do to a giant, you loser. <laughs> shut up. Hey, let Burt Prentice do all the manly talk here this week, okay? He didn't call nobody honey or nothing. I mean, he was just no. like mm -mm. just all about it this week. So I was pretty pleased with that promo. So we're uh, we they put some heat on the old six man tag, and so now we're ready for for match number two. And again, the way we've been doing lately, you know, the other week we had uh, Waller and Jarrett just swapped opponents on TV. They wrestled the two opponents on TV that then they were each going to wrestle on the Coliseum show. So what does that mean? We're going to see Dirty Doug Gilbert, the king of rock and roll, take on old Jeff Jarrett. So let's see how that played out. And I will say, we did change things up a little. And we are set to go with a one fall, 15 minute time limit match. We had a good one a couple of minutes ago, and this one shaped up to be a pretty good one, too. Indeed, Doug Gilbert and Jeff Jarrett. Jeff backs him up and whips Doug into the rope. Ooh, Doug goes under. Oh, boy, and look at this. Well, Doug has been doing that celebration thing here for the last few weeks. He goes at a dance. Boy, oh. that's a dancing. No, I don't like that too much, Doug. And, it, and then he goes down on one knee, sort of that uh, that uh, Elvis imitation after a couple of the karate kicks and stuff. But hey, whip Jeff in on. Jeff comes off and a big hip toss on him. Well, there he goes. Calls himself the king of rock and roll. Doug Gilbert. Hey, on Jared. You know, I think Eddie agrees with us too. I think Eddie's kind of wondering what's wrong with Doug again. He, yeah, I think you're right. We're all left in limbo about that Gilbert. Boy, he is with a chop there on Jeff. Doug using that fist. Got Jeff. Jared, oh, Doug Gilbert just picks him up. Off the ropes. Oh, boy. Oh, my goodness. Jeff oh, went deep. after him with a clothesline. Doug ducked out of the way, and the referee was right there. That was totally, boy. totally unintentional on Jeff's part. Hey, look at this. Here comes Brian Christopher. Got the chain, Doug nails Jeff Jarrett. Referee Kevin Christian is still out, though. Look across the ring. Yeah. That's Eddie Gilbert. Whoa. Doug finally woke up in there. After Eddie wakes him up. The Harris brothers have hit the ring. And Jeff Jarrett, oh boy, it's two against one. Mike Samples has sent him in there as the Harris brothers are double teaming Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> hey, Marlon, you better get another another man in here because they're about to end Jeff Jarrett's career. Her tip to see. Her tip to see. Hey, here comes some help. Bruno passes a metal chair oh to Jeff Jarrett. And yeah. <laughs> so the big takeaway from that is guys you didn't need to pay an eight foot giant from the wwf to come out here to handle the harris brothers all you need is bruno in one steel chair and they yes. run for the hills they're out of here <laughs> i just want to highlight everything from that promo i want to highlight kevin christian's ability to fall in small spaces like I've never seen yeah. anyone. I've seen one able... person. I've seen one person, other person, Josh. I think <laughs> you're leaving that out of the story. So 
I'm pretty good at falling in small spaces <laughs> too. Like I, I could be in a broom closet and somehow end up sideways. Mm-hmm. I got really drunk one night with Richard had to be my babysitter and he turned to close the door and I was in the gutter between the car, mind you. And I feel like a blob of clothes. It was just, have you ever seen a, um, one of those implosions of a building where it just falls straight down, <laughs> man lost all his bones and fell straight down into the alleyway. <laughs> I don't know how he did it. You thought that was the damnedest shit you ever yeah. saw till you saw Kevin Christian get clotheslined and that son of a bitch <laughs> did a complete flip and landed on his, he could have done that in a broom closet. Like, and he so, just stayed folded. He stayed folded up for like five minutes. <laughs> uh, so it's so what I'm hearing is we need to book Josh versus Kevin Christian in a phone booth somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing you guys could have actually had a decent match in that bungee cord match that Mike Davis and them had in global back in the day. That was the worst thing I've ever seen happen on a wrestling show. Oh my god, dude! Yeah, I, I just. I could not get past that bump. That was the damnedest <laughs> shit I'd ever seen. Mm. And he had so much movement in that just that little tiny space. Because whenever Jeff comes for the clothesline, Kevin's what? I mean, at the most, two feet off of the ropes. At the oh, most. Yeah. And he, he had to do all that shit and get folded up. And uh, then you get the Harris brothers coming in there well, just, notice the disdain in his voice when he just said the name and he's like the kevin then you get the harris brother it all there was, went to shit it did until <laughs> then now this the clip didn't show it but i i know about this because i rewound it at least 10 times when i was re-watching the show one of the harris brothers i'm not sure who it was but they threw a fit after the save came after eddie came and bruno with the chair and all that and they were out there just they grab a, uh, the desk chair at one point and just place it awkwardly into the the ring and then they set it back up <laughs> and they go back to grab something else and somehow one of the camera cords or the mic cords gets tangled around one of their feet and they almost bust their ass. And I mean, he trips and has to catch himself and that the crowd pops. And that was the biggest pop out of any of this shit <laughs> since the Harris brothers showed up that they have gotten thus far was one of them almost busting his ass. And it made me so happy. We're going to have to, pay, we're gonna have to plug that into next week's show or something. <laughs> But I, I swear to you, I at least rewound it 10 times and just <laughs> laughed my ass off. I don't question that one bit. I, don't, I do not doubt you at all when you say 10 times. Yeah. Uh, so the other takeaway from this match is at this point, holy, Doug is leaning into this King of Rock and Roll, King of Rock and Roll thing. Like, I can't wait. Like, the very first thing I want to ask Doug, and uh, I'm working on getting him on this very podcast soon to talk about this feud with Eddie, is uh, tell me about the king of rock and roll. Like, what's the concept here? Like, how did this come about? Because, you know, he's feuding with Eddie, and Eddie doesn't have any, you know, there's no context to the rock and roll thing. Like, Eddie's not honky-tonk man or anything. Like, I just, I, I don't understand where it fits into this feud, you know. And I see, like, Dave and them will just call him Dirty Doug Gilbert. But then when he starts doing those dances and stuff, they kind of have to, hey, call called us out the king of rock and roll. I don't know what the fuck he's dancing like that for? <laughs> but uh, I'm just curious to, if that was supposed to be going somewhere and then we moved away from it. I know I've heard a story about uh, Jerry Jarrett was trying to get him booked on some foreign tours to replace the Honky Tonk Man for the WWF on some foreign tours. So that was... I mean, that would make sense for the gimmick, but I don't really know why he's getting it over on Memphis TV or trying to. But anyway, I look forward to asking him about that. But pretty good little match here, and at least we put a twist on. It wasn't just straight up, uh, you know, the Harris brothers or Brian, you know, just ran in. You know, the referee takes this awkward bump that, you know, Josh has described perfectly here that he, you know, gets tapped with Jeff's arm in the clothesline, and he immediately turns his flip like <laughs> In, you know, running clothesline and so he's down so brian comes out hands doug the chain and chug ch- uh, doug lays out jeff and then eddie comes in so at least we put a a little bit of a twist on the uh the interference finish so i do respect that we tried to do something a little different but i just find it funny that you know we're trying to build up the harrises and and brian christopher is a plausible threat for for lawler Jarrett, and the giant gonzalez 
but all it took was Bruno handing one chair off to Jarrett and they run for the hills and they're out there, you know, tripping over themselves and making a laughing stock of their self. <laughs> the segment ends, but um, people are going to show up anyway, right? I think hopefully so we're going to talk about that a little later on. Uh, so after the commercial break, Eddie Marlin brings out a belt and announces that they are starting a USWA middleweight division uh, that will be wrestlers who weigh 199 pounds or less. But the big twist, guys, as if this was an M. Night Shyamalan movie, it will include lady wrestlers, as he put it. And uh, Eddie Marlin and Dave, you know, this is 1993, so they're both, uh, they both say they're pretty skeptical about women competing with men. But Eddie Marlin then says, it's 1993. <laughs> so they're, they're very forward thinking. Well, he's going to let them vote. We might as well let them wrestle each other. Yeah. Wrestle oh. men, right? <laughs> What was it? What was it? Four weeks ago, yeah. five weeks ago, Eddie said, I will not hit a woman, but I will yank her hair and I will spank her fanny. Yeah, that's right. So, you know. It means something totally different in England, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> True. If Adrian Street was here, when he got to the back, he'd be like, oh, Yeah, wait. you're going to do what now? <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Linda, hide from Eddie Mullins. <laughs> 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 Miss Texas comes out and announces that she will be in the tournament because there's no competition in the women's division right now. She shits on Lauren, Lauren Davenport, and Leslie Ballinger, and all the great women athletes that they have here in the USWA that <laughs> apparently since uh, Mike Miller has moved on. Um, I figured kind of without anything to do, uh, literally. You figure both Lauren and uh, uh, what's the other one's name? Lauren Davenport and Ballinger. Leslie Ballinger. Yeah. Both of them would have went with Mike the way he was talking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, because they're just there for one thing. And I think you guys know what it is. I'm not going to say it out loud, but it wasn't yeah. a wrestling match. No, um, that, that, so you don't really get a good look at it here. The following week when the new champion wears it out, they zoom it in on it. But I'm curious, have we just took that global light heavyweight title that Uncle Danny made off with? <laughs> and repurposed it for this. Is that what's Man, happening? Man, this is like the third time it's been repurposed. And it ain't the last either. That title would go on to be the very first Ohio Valley wrestling title. Because I used to play with it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how many times did you and Richard swap that title back and forth in your yard at some point? I'll do it at least two or three until I lost the hair match. <laughs> and he said uh, that you can go, if you find our podcast, it's like back in 2018 when Uncle Danny came on our show, he said that he figured we were in there rummaging around his room. <laughs> and because, you know, he would use my grandmother's house as like a base whenever mm -hmm. he would come back and stuff. He would go somewhere else and come back. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we would go in there and Pilfer we would, with this shit. We would <laughs> hey, these are vitamins and all this. We would get like his outfits, anything yeah. that we thought would be cool to wear at the time. Beat up wrestling buddies in the living room. Yep. And um, if we had like a tag team situation, I had that old WCW foam belt. And yeah. then we would have the global belt. <laughs> I always so, got stuck with yeah, the foam belt. His ass was the foam belt champion. I was always the global. And belt. I was a fat kid. I couldn't wear the foam belt. You, you got to be the foam belt Texas <laughs> champion, Richard. Oh, man. You know that belt don't mean shit that Brian just carries around for fun. And you got to be the master of terror. Oh, man. <laughs> but, dude, um, why does talking, this one have a zipper on the front? <laughs> talking about uh, that that particular show, whenever he came on, we specifically asked him because I've never heard him kind of say what happened. But we specifically asked, "Why did you? What happened with Global, and why did you leave and take the title?" And he fucking acted like he couldn't remember or anything like that. <laughs> so so I, I I still don't know. Still but might I, get booked there, so you don't want to burn gifted, a bridge. They gifted me that for being such a great champion. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm sure that's what happened. <laughs> it's like Danny, nobody can beat you for this title. So just take this with you back to Memphis. And <laughs> right. Eddie's gonna Eddie's gonna jack the North American title. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have He's no like freaking health down here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, to give us a little sampling of, of what we can expect in this this tournament where potentially there could be a woman versus a man. Now, in the first round, as we'll find out when Dave runs down the card in a little bit, it's going to be woman versus woman in the first round of this 
middleweight title tournament. But right here, we're going to see Miss Texas taking on the Shadows. So let's see how Miss Texas fares against a man in a wrestling match, as Eddie Marlin says. I entered the middleweight division because in the women's division, you have Lauren Davenport and Leslie Ballinger. That's not competition. I'm a better athlete than they are. But I tell you what, I might not be able to beat all the guys, if any, but I'm going to give them a run for their money. Well, I don't have any doubt about this. said, hey, we, we deserve a shot at, uh, at winning the tournament, not a special ladies division and all of that. So put us in there. And uh, you heard Eddie Marlin say it. He said, okay, that's the way it's going to be. And that's what we got now, Miss Texas. Oh, oh Shadow Wicks. Fingers right across the eyes of Miss Texas. This Shadow comes in out of parts of no token Miss Texas over there. That'll to be a break for Miss Texas. This mixed up Miss Texas up in there. And the sets the Shadow up. Picks up the Shadow. Look, Look at, at that. that would you? Wow. Miss Texas <laughs> picks the Shadow up, slams him down. Just with the knee and boy, it's a harder day for the shadow than he thought it'll be. Against Miss Texas. Boy, she's up on the top rope now. Shadow out on a big splash from Miss Texas. She got it. One, two, three. Miss Texas, your winner. Boy, she's some kind of tough. Let me tell you. Hmm. Super flying got nothing on Miss Texas. Look at that. <laughs> no knees involved. <laughs> Crash. Yeah, poor shadow. There. <laughs> I love how the fact they're like, yeah, women can do everything men can do, but the guy that's going to lose to uh, Miss Texas is going to be head to clad. So you can't even see that it's a male under there. <laughs> well, no, sure, I that could have been anybody. Yeah. I told Richard while we were watching this back, I mean, come on. Why did they not get like Tony Williams or somebody to be the shadow for this particular match for TV? Yeah. Because that would have made the size scaling at least similar. And I'm not, Shitting on Tony Williams, I mean, yeah. for real, you know how tall no, he is. Yeah. He would have been perfect. Put him into that that whole garb. You wouldn't know who it is because it could be Bill Rush. You never know. <laughs> but like sure. somebody where it didn't look like she was beating somebody a foot taller than her, yeah. you know, that would have made more sense for the old school minded people that were more than likely watching this. I mean, I thought it was great when it, when I was watching it at the time, but I imagine there were people that. Why they got a woman in there? You know what I mean? If you want to play a fun game, go back on the YouTube channel and watch this whole episode and watch Miss Texas' promo and keep an eye on Corey Macklin behind her as he's struggling. You see his eyes go down and then up and then down and then up. <laughs> oh, you'll see you looking. Don't look at her butt. Don't look. Oh, there it is. Uh, uh, over there. Over there. And he's going shape, up man. and down. Up and down. <laughs> he's trying his best not to look at her. I'm sure she's called him out on that at some point but uh it's always fun in these promos folks if you watch the whole shows is to watch Corey in the background selling what they say watching dave mug to the camera sometimes selling <laughs> what they say it's uh it adds a whole new element to these so if you haven't picked up on that yet definitely watch their faces in these promos because it, it it's a lot of fun in my opinion anyway i will say am i wrong in thinking and now that you know we're in this day and age where everybody's bigger faster stronger 199 seems very light it almost felt like they were burying mr uncle danny by saying like i would have said like maybe 230 and under you know because i think of somebody that's 230 is thin and you know like athletic build you know but 199 just seems really low does it not well i guess to be able to to build to justify having miss texas and leslie ballinger and and uh Lauren Davenport in the in the matches to start with because yeah. I don't I don't figure they're two thirty are they? No, did they no. ever get any short Americans in this tournament? Do we I don't know? think so. Little people? No, I don't think so. I don't. Eventually, while the title was still around, you may have had Little Eagle or Midget <laughs> D or somebody go for the belt. I don't, I don't. I don't remember. We'll we'll hopefully see that soon enough. But uh, so then we get our our weekly promo battle with with Richard Lee. And uh, there's Richard Lee. Well, he's disappeared. There's Richard Lee in his fancy suit with the gold guitars on it. Uh, he comes out. And, of course, you know, Mike Samples makes his way out. And mm -hmm. 
I love they talk that. Smack like, back and forth. Yelling in Dave's ear. And look at the look of disgust on Corey's face there in the bottom corner. He's like, this shit again? Come on. <laughs> I'm tired of it, Dave. I'm tired How of it. How many weeks can the moon dogs wrestle the Hash Brothers? <laughs> so, I feel like so, we're just you know, playing reruns at this point, Jerry. <laughs> if we could pick one good match they had, it just showed that one every week. <laughs> so, of course, you know, they're, they've got a... They, they 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 get into it. It breaks down into somewhat of a fight, I guess you could call it. Uh, because despite the fact that the Harris brothers have already been advertised to be in a six-man tag that I'm assuming is going to be the main event, you think that gets you off the hook? You think you're not going to see the Harris brothers wrestle the Moon Dogs? <laughs> I don't think so. You're going to see. Don't worry. USWA's putting on a show. You're going to see the Harris brothers wrestle the Moon Dogs. It's going to happen. So. Uh, Yes, once again, they're going to wrestle. So we let Mike Samples and uh, Richard Lee get into a fight down on the ground. He's straddling him like Eddie and Doug were just a little short while ago. So uh, don't you worry. We're going to keep our, our, our consecutive weeks of every week having the Moondogs versus the Bruce Brothers match is going to be intact. So, do, you think, uh, do you think what happened was because they're twins – they accidentally just by no fault of their own double paid the Harris brothers. Like they came in and gave one two times the money. And the other one was like, I didn't get anything, brother. You paid my brother twice. And there's like, oh, well, shit. Well, we'll pay you again, but you're going to you work go. twice next week. So in this segment, and I, I apologize for not having a clip of it. I know you guys are going to be bummed out, especially Josh, but uh, believe it or not, once again, the Harris brothers and Mike Samples triple team Richard Lee. Uh, I guess the Moon Dogs have made their second trip to the gym now because uh, they weren't here again, wherever, wherever they were at. Luckily, we didn't make the absurd uh, statement that all oh, are at the gym today. So the uh, resident runners end uh, the runners the the resident baby face. This is to make the save. Jeff Jarrett, Eddie Gilbert had to run out here and, and save Richard Lee uh, from a beat down from the Harris brothers, but don't worry. Uh, as we've learned in recent weeks, Richard Lee is completely immune to beatings from the Harris brothers and Mike samples. He's perfectly fine. fine. So not a problem at all. So once we get that cleaned up, Corey Macklin tells us about all the USWA action coming out of town, as they say. And once Corey gets through telling us about that, what do you think we need guys? You know what we need. We need more Mike Samples. <laughs> so now Mike Samples is back out here, and he comes out to tell us about the hair versus hair aspect of this week's match because not only are the Moon Dogs going to wrestle the Harris Brothers again, but this time both managers' hair is on the line. In the last couple of weeks, one week, one of the managers' hair would be on the line against the belts. The manager, The team whose manager didn't have his hair up would win. We did that back and forth a couple of weeks. So now this week, both managers' hairs on the line. We're guaranteed to have somebody's head shaved because, guys, I think we can all agree. If there's one thing we haven't seen enough of in recent months here in the USWA, it's freaking hair matches. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like uh, we just have not seen enough hair versus hair matches. So let's do it again. Let's see. Are we going to see a ball-headed Richard Lee or are we going to see a ball-headed Michael Sample? Too bad they can't really put a care. stipulation on this to where I care. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you must care about this match. That's the stipulation. <laughs> and again, you know, we try not to we try not to be too critical, but it's like y'all couldn't take a one week break. We we finally got the Harris brothers into something else that doesn't involve the Moon Dogs, and we couldn't take one week off from having these two teams wrestle. I mean, the Moon Dogs aren't even here today, so yeah. let's just skip this week. Nope. Well, it's Still Mike Samples' it. fault for attacking Richard Lee like every fucking week. And then Richard <sighs> Lee's Moondogs get pissed and Mike Samples has to, well, I got the Harris brothers. Yeah. And they don't show well, up somebody threw baloney with quaaludes in the hall and they played <laughs> it and fell asleep. <laughs> Clearly, Mike Samples writes roast jokes about Richard Lee and the Moondogs every week and he has to get them in on television, <laughs> yeah. you know. He is like, if, if I go one week without calling them the moon hogs, I just don't know what I'm going to do, you know. Uh, although I, I was a fan of his line about Richard Lee gets his gets his seats out of the dumpster behind Goodwill or whatever it was he said a couple weeks ago. That was 
feels pretty spot on. That feels like one of them shoots, like they say, brother. But uh, anyway, after uh, about four weeks, four or five weeks now of seeing the uh, the videos each week, the rap videos, PG-13 are going to make their way out into the studio live for the very first time. So let's uh, let's see what these guys have to say before we see their debut television match. The hip-hop team. PG-13. Well, Jay Brown, it's what y'all been looking for. It's PG-13 in the house, homies. Yo, yo, Key, what's up, Corey, bro? Give me some scam, my man. What's happening, brother? You know, Corey, the Oreo. Man, Oreo, 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 what's up, homie? But, you know, we here to talk about this middleweight tournament. You know, it's like we lightweight, we heavyweight, we in between weight, middle. Matter of fact, we can't wait, bro. PG-13 is what's up in 1993. You gentlemen, what's up with us, man? I'm just telling that after we get done with that middleweight, we're going uh, straight to the tag team championship. PG-13 is in the house, bro. <laughs> well, they're going. They're they're entered in the middleweight oh, tournament oh. as single wrestlers, and uh, they say which whichever one of them wins. Oh, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> we middleweight, heavyweight, man, we can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jamie Dundee, uh, Corey looked less than amused by PG thirteen. Uh, what are I you guys thoughts on their first time on the mic out here? I love how they singled out Corey and just treated him that. <laughs> so different than they did Dave. They like shook up with Corey and everything. They walk out. They're like, "What's up, Dave? Corey, my man!" They put the hat on him and all yeah. that shit. Oh, I love it. But I you love know, that. You know what? And I, I sent you this message earlier this week, you and Josh. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's it it's baffling because for me. Rap was starting to take off right here, and you'll hear the crowd later on. They kind of get behind, you know, PG 13 with the hey ho type stuff and you know, all that stuff. And my thoughts were, has there ever been a musical gimmick in Memphis that was babyface? Like, because they're supposed to be the rap guys. It's like, yeah. who had the hard on? Was it Lawler that was just like, you know what? You could how you make somebody a heel. You you make them a music fan. If well, they're I mean, a fan of music, they are heels because you got Jimmy Hart, Honky Tonk Man. Uh, now you got the King of Rock and Roll, the Rock and Roll Phantom, PG thirteen. But then uh, Rock and Roll Express, yeah, it was like the only one that w- and they they weren't like instrument. But they never, music. yeah, I'd say they never claimed to be rock and rollers though, they right? Just- tied bandanas around their shiny britches but <laughs> uh i mean i guess the only exception to that is when lawler himself used to make his make those songs and videos in the 70s but i think he was still a heel at that point wasn't mm-hmm. right. i don't think he put out any songs once he was a baby face uh you know maybe jimmy valiant might have been the exception at some point but but no you're right I, I racked my brain after you sent that uh yeah fun fact folks that we have a uh a group text that we, we talk to each other throughout the week about notes about the show and different things. Nice. And uh, I, uh, I spent the rest of the day racking my brain. Like I can't give an example of any baby face musical music related uh, wrestlers other than like you say, uh, rock and roll express, but rock and roll express waited until they got to the Carolinas before Ricky started trying to sing on stage, you know, the old boogie woogie <laughs> dance hall. Thank God yeah. Memphis was spared of that <laughs> and, and pg-13 when they stopped rapping they were babies yeah then they the boogie then they woogie babies. man i mean i guess was jimmy valiant was kind of a rocking like type guy and he was a heel it makes you think like what yeah. happened to lawler at like art school did he ever run in with some musicians and he was like nope done with it N- not on my show some yeah. band nerds beat up the art nerds, and he's held a grudge ever since, yeah. it seems. Even in uh, car rides with Lawler, it's just all he has is his thoughts in the wind. You ain't hearing a tune on that radio. <laughs> it's like, uh, no, that makes me a heel. When I'm a bad guy, I'll start listening to Power 92 or something, but <laughs> till then, no. <laughs> all right, so J.C. Ice and Sir Wolfie D, PG-13, are about to have their debut match, in the studio at least. They've been down to the Coliseum the last couple of weeks, but they're going to take on Bill Rush and T.D. Steele. Let's see how this goes for them. I expect, uh, I expect those non-middleweights like 
the Bruise Brothers and the Moon Dogs. And yeah. We're looking forward to that. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I haven't seen yeah. proof in action. You have, Corey, in the well, arenas, but uh, boy, let me this... tell you, they could be a good team, but the tactics they use and all of this stuff, boy, it makes you look at that. That's so cocky. Well, as soon as you ring the bell, that's what that kind of stuff. That's uh, Wolfie D starting, right? <laughs> Against TD Steele. TD Steele with a little warm up exercise beforehand and tangles up with Wolfie D. A good move from Bill. Oh, boy. BG 13, they're in the USWA. Heard a lot about them and. They're here today on Championship Wrestling, and his wrist hung in the ropes, and uh, Wolfie D then shoved him on down to the floor. Now, what is this? Look at this. Dundee comes oh, off! Oh, my goodness. Oh, boy! J.C. Ice! A slingshot. G13, and Wolfie D picks up Bill Rush. He's uh, got him over there. Dundee picks up that hubcap that they bring in the ring. He nailed Rush right in the back of the head with it, too. Boy, now see, now that's the kind of stuff you talk about. Had Rush already been earlier, just want to humiliate Bill Rush. Nails him with a piece of that hot cap from, that they bring in the ring. And PG-13 gets the one, two, three. But you saw how they did it. Let's take a break. We'll be back with USWA action still to come. So with their size and their gimmick, and some of the high flying moves, I didn't put it in the clip there, but you know, Wolfie does a, a moonsault off the top rope. Jamie does that dive to the floor. You're going to have a little bit of an uphill battle of them not coming off like baby faces. So I guess one way to combat that, use the hubcap to beat enhancement guys. So uh, <laughs> we're going for some heat here in their very first match. And uh, one other note before I hand it off to you guys, I'm almost positive that Bill Rush bought those tights he's wearing from Uncle Danny, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> No, I think you'd be right. Yeah, because <laughs> he he wore those in the late '80s and the very early '90s. But like, it's like he started going with other shit as the '90s kept on progressing. But man, you're talking about connection with the crowd yeah. right there at the end. You you highlighted they did all the high fly moves and stuff. But back during this time and even afterwards, you know, like usually heel wrestlers were encouraged no matter what. Don't encourage the fans if they're starting to get on your side. You don't yeah. want that. That's not your job. And then they both kind of get out of the ring. And then you hear the crowd, hey, oh, and Wolfie does it, one revolution. And then he's like, oh, shit. And then he stops, <laughs> you know, because he knew he'd probably get a dog cussing yeah. whenever he got to the back. But, like, yeah, that that their personas were so powerful that even with that heel shit in the early nineties, the fans could not help but love them. I just, that that's, that's a really powerful thing. You that, know what I mean? And that was the one thing that I jotted down when I was watching this show is like, they missed the boat with making these guys. He, I, maybe they just needed more heels in the, in the company, but that's geez, the only thing I can figure is that you yeah. needed heels because I, these guys could have came in baby faces right off the jump. And I think they, I think they would have got over, a lot bigger, a lot sooner. If you'd have just not fought the uphill battle of trying to make folks hate them. Cause like you said, even with everything they did, they just clubbed this guy with a hook cap. They're still haying and hoeing and they're still wanting to get behind them. And, and we're talking about the early nineties here, which was starting to get an edge to it. You know, we're, we're just, yeah. you know, a year or two away from, you know, the ECW era where they were pal driving women. And that was like considered cool, you know, um, the hubcap thing people would look past you know what i mean it's like yeah that would just be hey they're they're cool because they do break rules but you know that's their stick you know but yeah i mean i don't know how long the, i feel like re my memory says they worked heel a lot longer than they did um but it feels like it took them forever to turn them and it was just right there yeah. for them it was almost a year, I think, wasn't it? At least, yeah, it was at least a year. And, you know, Wolfie talked about in that interview I did with him that aired last week uh, in episode nine that after after the match, he didn't mention if they got scolded for, you know, going along with the crowd. But Wolfie did get scolded uh, for uh, not facing the camera during the during the promo. 
And, you know, we talked about the fact that, you know, Jamie had been on TV because, you know, he had done some, he did some things with Bill, you know, he'd been JC Ice Baby, the little manager and and did, you know, things all the way back into the CWA in like 88, 89. Um, but this is Wolfie's first break on TV. So like Wolfie has been doing, you know, quote unquote, outlaw indie shows, you know, in and around Nashville and Kentucky. And, you know, here he is, his TV debut live on, you know, WMC, which is, you know, like me and him talked about, you know, at their size, this seems like it would be the peak of what these guys could hope to do is to be on Memphis television. And they're making their debut in the, you know, more or less the main event spot here. Um, he hadn't done any television up to here, not even really any local stuff. So, you know, he, he's like, well, I didn't know to face the camera. It's the first time I'd ever been on TV and I'm on live Memphis television in front of more people than, you know, <laughs> I could ever imagine. And, you know, we, we kind of talked about in that interview, how they, they went on to, you know, for guys, their size starting in Memphis. I mean, you talk about some overachievers, man, that end up in the, you know, the WWF and WCW and ECW and do all the things those guys did with that gimmick over the years was, it's pretty impressive, but this is where it all kicked off. But I totally agree. Like if we did us came out the box as baby faces, I think they would have been over huge from the word go. Um, but, you know, you said something very intriguing there too. You know, this is like his first, I think a lot of times people will watch these old Memphis tapes and think, well, that was just a regional area. You know, but you got to think there wasn't that many options back then. And you got to think, I would love to know what the ratings were, like how many people were watching, because it would be easy to say between Louisville, Nashville and Memphis in that little triangle area there, there had to be at least what, almost a million viewers a week. Well, you got to oh, yeah. think though that that area wasn't watching live like we were. No, but I'm saying like. They You're were talking still, about the tape. They're and all still that. watching it. They're still getting views. So it's like it's it's easy to write it off because it's a studio show, and you're thinking, well, this is just a small studio. But yeah, like you said, like that kind of hit home with me. It's like there's like probably a couple million people watching because I mean it's on network TV. Oh, yeah. It's documented that WMC had a big enough area coverage area mm-hmm. that there were well over a million people watching it live in Memphis every Saturday, even in the waning years. Like, you know, even though we're not packing the Coliseum on every Monday night, people were still watching the TV show. And so to put that in perspective for people, look at these ratings that everybody's crying about AEW. AEW is a national wrestling company that can barely get a half a million people to watch their show uh, on Friday nights and Saturday nights and, and even Dynamite. You know, it's high fives all around. If we even get in the realm of, you know, eight, nine hundred thousand viewers and on a Saturday morning Memphis program and the studio doing these finishes that we're griping about, there's over a million people watching this. And then when you figure in the rest of the territory, like like you're saying, Richard, you know, where they went, saw it in Evansville, Nashville, all the different places, you know, you're talking probably three million or more saw this before it was over with. So, you know. As, as, there weren't as many options back then. Even in 93, you did not have the options on television in general, and you certainly didn't have the options for wrestling. Like You couldn't hop on your computer and watch 101 wrestling shows right. at any given time. So it was a big deal. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, back in the 80s Memphis, a lot of those guys, you know, by the time they made it on Memphis TV, had been around to some different territories. They were experienced at least with tape wrestling television. You know, they at least had done TV tapings at places. Not many people had this kind of live experience, but, you know, Wolfie said, that he's like, I really hadn't done hardly any TV at all. So, you know, my dream was, oh, maybe one day, someday, I might could be on Memphis TV. And he's just a little over a year into his career, and he's already he's achieved the dream. <laughs> he's already on Memphis television, you know, tagging with Bill Dundee's son. So uh, it's pretty impressive. So it's going to be fun. Uh, getting to watch them develop, uh, see the see the that that gimmick start right here in the very beginning, and watch it unfold through the rest of '93 and and moving forward. So um, they're here, weeks of weeks of uh, rap videos and everything, and so now they're here. So we'll watch and see what's next for them. And of course, 
what's next for them or what's first for them maybe is the middleweight tournament. But before we go there, let's take our second and final podcast commercial break. And then we're going to let Dave and Corey tell us what we've got in store for Monday night at the Coliseum. Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast, and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history. You can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade. So if you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. I don't know why, why they would have chosen to replay those. <laughs> Richard Lee punches to lead us into break, but they did. So I thought I would share them as well since we didn't see the actual clip. I thought that would tell you everything you need to know about that segment and why Slow we and didn't powerful. necessarily do it. <laughs> Ground and pound, brother. Richard knows about that. That's an MMA reference, not anything <laughs> not anything else. If that no, sounded... You hit both, both nails on the head there. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's uh let's hear what this has all been building to. Let's hear what the card's gonna be for the Mid South Coliseum this Monday night. Opening uh, first round match of the night, you're gonna have Danny Davis going against Wolfie D. And by the way, I'm not sure uh, which order the first round matches will go in, but let me tell you what all four of the first round matches are. Danny Davis against Wolfie D. Master of Terror will be going against Chris Michaels. Aaron Hatchett goes against Jamie Dundee. And Miss Texas will go against Leslie Bellinger. Now, that's that's a woman against a woman. But as uh, Eddie Marlin pointed out, in the uh, semifinal match, that means that one of the women is going to be going against a male wrestler. Yeah, and that'll indeed. be the first time for that in tournament action. Semifinal match is number one and number two, followed by the finals of the middleweight tournament. Then the winner of the two semifinals go to the finals. You got this grudge match coming up. And, boy, this one, uh, especially after what's going on today, uh, yeah. uh, Eddie Gilbert and Doug Gilbert, it just seems that uh, they're not able to get it settled. And when this thing first started, I got to tell you, Doug Gilbert came out here and he was saying Eddie's always late and he didn't show up and all that sort of thing. Kind of believed him. I believed him. I, I was right there with Doug. And I said, well, you know, maybe you're right, Doug. At, uh, you know, Eddie's just irresponsible. And then come to find out when Eddie comes in and tells his side of the story, he the reason he was late because Doug didn't pick him up. He yeah. left and all of that sort of thing. And uh, Eddie says Doug is just jealous of the entire situation. And every now and then when they were kids, Eddie said uh, Doug would just keep picking at him until finally he had to bear down and put him back in his place. And he says that's what he's going to have to do come Monday night. Eddie says i got to bear down and take care of Doug, get him thinking straight again, and that'll last for at least a little while. Brother against brother, Eddie Gilbert against Doug Gilbert in the grudge match Monday night. Southern title will be on the line then. Jeff Jarrett, he has wanted this return match. You know, he had to wait forever to get a match with with Brian Christopher for, for the title and then won it. Uh, wasn't able to keep it long because of some interference from outside the ring and what have you, but uh, he gets another chance this time. Jeff Jarrett will be going against the Southern title holder, Brian Christopher. Christopher, of course, with Burt Prentice over in his corner. The hair match. Hair against hair. No time limit. No disqualification. No stopping the match. 
folks from the perfect cut are going to be there. Clippers in hand, ready to shave somebody's head, either Richard Lee's or Mike Samples. Moondogs with Richard Lee going against Ron and Don Harris, the Bruce Brothers, with Mike Samples in their corner. Samples says, I'm not worried. These guys are big. These guys are tough. I don't know if he's paying attention or not, but the Moondogs won last time around, and if they win Monday night, then Mr. Samples is going to find himself with a haircut. That's not all. Main event of the night. This one should Boy, be something look else. For this one, yeah. yeah, Brian Christopher and the Bruise Brothers with Mike Samples. Six-man match. It'll be Lawler, Jarrett, and Giant Gonzalez coming in with downtown Bruno. He's eight feet tall. Boy. It should be an exciting night at the Mid-South Coliseum. The night of He's 24 stars. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't bother to count the stars this week, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, pretty bummed out the rock and roll phantom isn't going to be there but uh so no no uh no performance from him and bert so that's probably going to bring down the house this week so uh it's time it's that time guys let's answer those all important questions about the show that we have you answer each and every week so first and foremost what was your least favorite part of today's show um i'll be honest right now not a big fan of this middleweight division. Um, call me old fashioned, but and I, I hope I don't get any emails over this. I'm I'm not a big fan of men wrestling women. Um, <laughs> I'm just not. I mean, to me, and I, like I said, no emails. Full grown man should always be able to take care of business. With a woman <laughs> in, in an athletic event. That's, you know, I was like, am I take care of business? You mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I mean? You know, come on, think you about know, it. Richard at, no, I'm just <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's the whole debate right now with, you know, athletes and sports and women's divisions, right? Is, you know, the competitiveness and you got testosterone, bone structure, density, it's hard for a woman to compete on that level. And I'm, you know, part of me wants to say, what is Memphis doing? Because this seems like totally something they would have been against, you know, from the get go. And if you, you listen to, uh, Cornette's podcast, he talks about how ridiculous it is that women are in there competing with men. You know, it's, it would be different if it was guys like the size of Bruno, or like you said earlier, Tony Williams, uh, but you know, we're talking about Mr. Uncle Danny, Wolfie D, JC Ice. You know, it just doesn't feel right, you know what I mean? But that's just me, I could be alone in that feature. So, you're probably wondering <laughs> what the worst part for me was not really, but let's yeah. say it anyway. I've got to work it in. It's just, and it, it is the worst part for me personally, not one, not two three Harris brother appearances. Mm. It's a Harris Harris heavy show. And like I said, each time I see those guys, it's like, I, I don't know, man. It goes I, back inside him a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's definitely <laughs> turtle head. Yeah. Yeah. Bruce it, brothers trifecta this week. <laughs> it's just God awful. They're mm. fucking rotten, man. They're wow. rotten. Wow. The, the punch kick express the goddamn bruiser it's like bruiser brody and uh, i don't want to say all that uh, either way <laughs> i loved it i love in the, the early weeks like these were just subtle like i just didn't really care for the harris yeah. brother segment and now we're episode 10 you're like them pieces of shit are terrible. They're like, yeah. it's like somebody well, dug up well, Bruiser Brody's corpse and he's trying to wrestle, except his would be better. Like, oh my God. Come That's out good. there with that frizzy hair. They need to get some Pantene Pro V. Jesus Christ. <laughs> some bitches they don't even heard. have fur on their boots, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't never heard of V. Dale Seth thing. I love how you painted yourself in a corner too. You're like, they're like Bruiser Brody. So you got the bruise in there and then you got to brothers and you're like, Ooh, I can't. <laughs> well, I was going to say it's like Bruiser yeah. Brody and Kim Jong-un jerked off in a cup. And there you have the Harris twins. Cause I hate Kim Jong-un about the same, but like, America? yeah, dude, my God, they are so fucking horrible, and they did it three times. I just, I, I wanted to not watch the show after the second one, and then I just like, you got to power through. You're, you're a trooper. Either way, I, I hate those guys. So just to recap, to give a short version of what these guys just said, basically Richard said, women have a place at a wrestling show. It's in the concession stand. Somebody's <laughs> yeah. got to serve the popcorn and cook the exactly. hot dogs. 
Those little and, hands. And, and, and Josh machine. has compared the Harris brothers to Kim Jong Un. Mm -hmm. um, that's a political figure. If you're just a wrestling fan that don't keep up with <laughs> politics, you can Google that. I don't know the exact spelling. Uh, <laughs> my reply to, I mean, I, we've all, you know, we've all talked about the Harris brothers ad nauseum. We won't, we won't go down that path again. But to reply to Richards, <laughs> the middleweight tournament. <laughs> it exists for two reasons in my mind. This is just my, this is just Gene Jackson's speculation. I'm not stating this as fact, because a lot of people on these, a lot of people on these nostalgia wrestling shows, I get annoyed listening to them because they just state things. That's their opinion as facts. And they're not always. So this is my opinion. That's my little disclaimer in the beginning. This tournament's happened for two reasons. One, we had that belt laying around. Let's do something with it. We got these small guys on the card. We got these two new PG-13 guys on the card. Let's get a belt to pass around amongst Danny Davis and the PG-13. But more importantly than that, the reason the women's aspect of it's in there, we want to use Miss Texas, and we don't want to spend money on talented women who could have competitive matches with Miss Texas. So let's find an excuse to put her in the ring with men. How many times can we watch Miss Texas beat up Leslie Bellinger or, you know, Lauren Davenport or uh, what was it last week? Candy Andy Kane, Kane, whoever the hell that was. <laughs> so screw it. Let's just let her wrestle the guys. We've got these small guys that she probably could really beat up in real life anyway. Let's yeah. just let her do it. And uh, we'll do it under the guise of she's competing for this belt. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's my take. So, question number two. What was your most favorite part of the show? Uh, I loved everything about the Eddie Gilbert promo and the thought of him and Brian. Like I said, it was great working up to it. I wish we would get that clean finish, but I understand why they didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that was probably my uh, – sadly, it was the start of the show. Uh, but, yeah, it was probably my favorite part of the show. So, mine – it's a two parter. Number one, <laughs> the fireball spot. Like mm -hmm. seriously, it it was like Michael Bay or somebody <laughs> directed that shit. And uh, Luger was about, I don't know, it had to have been at least an inch. And that's that's the max of being like a completely different character moving forward. <laughs> like he could have been a heel if he would have got that fireball would have hit him and really uh scarred him up or whatever. So the timing on that. It shows you why Luger's there, man. He's an absolute pro. The very last fucking second. Seamless. It looked fucking great. And number two, PG-13's debut. Mm -hmm. Like, to me, when I think back of the, the greatest tag teams in Memphis history, just my personal favorites, not like uh, just broad spectrum. Well, what about Billy Wicks and goddamn that? No, like my the original heavenly bodies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my personal favorite tag teams, PG 13 is in the top three. Like I absolutely love the gimmick. They were another set of dudes. Like it didn't matter. Hill baby face. They were excellent at both. And that is a true great wrestler. Uh, well, true, true, great wrestlers that can do that either or. And your third favorite moment was when the Harris brothers left. No, when they almost busted the one of them. I was, was waiting. I was like, an honorable mention when one almost ate shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I described that in length before already. Right, so that, right. that's a and we knew you liked it, so you didn't really have to. Yeah, we, I get it. But we'd be we'd be remiss if we didn't yes. at least acknowledge one more time that they they almost wiped out and you enjoyed it. All right, so uh, yeah, I can uh, I can I can co-sign both of those things. Uh, I agree with that. Um, and uh, of course, the final question is always: If we were still in 1993, uh, would today's television have inspired you to go buy a ticket for Monday night's card? If I was given a ticket, I would go. No, Let's the question see. is: Would you buy a ticket? I don't think I would buy a ticket for this one. I mean, the only thing that's going to spark my interest, to be honest, other than what we've seen already, you know, we just saw a tournament last week involving some of these guys. PG-13 wasn't in it, but we just saw a tournament la like a couple weeks ago, so I'm, I'm not good on tournaments. The only thing, Moondogs, Harris Brothers, we've seen that. 
the only thing that I'm kind of intrigued about going to see would be Eddie and Doug and, and giant Gonzalez, just because, Hey, this is a very large guy. He's here. Is it, he was a WCW guy like Luger. Let's go, let's go see him. Let's go see what he looks like. But I don't think I'm buying a ticket for this one. And Jeff's wrestling Brian and nobody's hairs even on the line. Right. <laughs> Josh. Yes, I definitely would buy a ticket because whenever WCW had uh giant Gonzalez, I never got to go and see him live. So like that's an attraction, man. Like he's taller than Andre, you know, I would want to see that no matter who he was first. And, and uh, I, I'm intrigued by the tournament, man, because like one of the best uh, memories I have is Miss Texas beating the absolute shit out of Randy Hales on a show. <laughs> and like, dude, a lot of times, man, like she was one of the highlights of the show. So I want to go and just see how she would fare against the real wrestlers. You know what I mean? Yeah, because there was a lot of those kind of novelty matches where she wrestled Bruno and she wrestled Brandon Baxter and Scott Bowden and Randy Hales and all these different people. But here she's going to be competing against some some real wrestlers, if you will. So March 1st, 1993 at the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. And this to me is the is the most interesting detail because we do have an attendance figure this week, guys. And this is the largest attendance we have had at the Coliseum in quite some time. Over 3,000 fans oh, at the Coliseum to see this card. Wow. So that's the most we've had here. Um, I think Mr. Perfect got us uh, almost... 2000 fans and since then we've been rocking right at a thousand the weeks that we've had uh attendance figures and the weeks that we did not see them had to be less based on who was there um all right so opening match big shocker here i think y'all would think we all could have called this one miss texas defeated leslie ballinger <laughs> to eliminate her from the middleweight tournament in <laughs> the second nice match <laughs> jc ice jamie dundee defeated hurricane hatchet in the third match, the Master of Terror, uh, Ken Wayne, defeated Chris Michaels. In the fourth match, Uncle Nightmare Danny Davis defeated Sir Wolfie D. In the fifth match, J.C. Ice Jamie Dundee defeated Miss Texas. In the sixth match, Nightmare Danny Davis defeated Master of Terror, Nightmare Ken Wayne. So, fun little battle of the nightmares. If we hadn't seen that a few times this year so far. And then in the finals, in the championship finals to crown the first ever USWA middleweight champion, the finals is Danny Davis versus J.C. Ice. Do you guys take, care to take a guess at who won the championship? No, it's Uncle Danny all yeah, the way. I was say, Danny, he owned the belt. He came with the belt. <laughs> <laughs> Your first ever USWA middleweight champion, J.C. Ice, Jamie Dundee oh, defeated. Oh, my Danny grandmother's Davis. right again. <laughs> yeah, you gotta listen to your guys. Let them be a lesson, Richard. Listen to your grandmother. He's lucky he didn't get his ass beat by that woman. Old job, old job <laughs> Davis I'm, ain't, ain't beating J.C. Ice, son. Hmm. And another uh, surprising ending, or perhaps not, I don't know. Dirty Doug Gilbert defeated Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert in their grudge match this week. <clears throat> And another, I don't know, maybe somewhat shocking uh, result. I'm not sure. Yeah. Jeff Jarrett pinned Brian Christopher to win back the USWA Southern Heavyweight title. Then the Bruise Brothers, Ron and Don Harris with Mike Samples, defeated Moondog Spot and Splat. And Richard Lee's head was shaved after the match. Sure, there'll be a rematch soon to <laughs> avenge <laughs> the loss. Gross hair back. There wasn't even enough hair to sweep up, though, was it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. He always has that hat on, you yeah, know, kind of like me. Yeah. If you see the sides, you think I got some hair to shave. I take this hat off. <laughs> I look like Richard over there. Main event, Jerry the King Lawler, Jeff Jarrett, and the Giant Gonzalez with downtown Bruno in their corner defeated Brian Christopher, Ron and Don Harris with both Burt Prentice and Mike samples. So we sent the 3000 home happy. And all three guys in that had lost two matches each that night. Yes. Wow. And, and you don't see that. Often. Wrestle once. You don't see that often, you know, with Brian losing and the, usually they tried to at least do one DQ to keep the heels strong, but well, except for Doug, all the babies went over, right? 
Well, the Harris brothers beat the, the Harris. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so yeah. they split. They split the, that night. They they lost. Okay. They won. They beat the Moon Dogs. They lost to the Giant Gonzalez and Lawler and Jarrett. So gotcha. Okay, never mind. I'm we got a new. We got a new Southern heavyweight champion in Jeff Jarrett. So I'm sure Brian's gonna have a lot to say about that next week. Look forward to that. We'll see if his the skin is starting to grow back on his face, as he said. <laughs> so, uh, all right, fun show this week, uh, folks. Please, wherever you are listening or viewing this, make sure you rate and review and leave us a comment. Uh, let us know what you think of the show. And if you're watching the video cast, please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And for all things related to the podcast, we're talking Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Everything can be found at USWA Podcast dot com as well as our store where you can purchase t-shirts we uh we sold some shirts this week guys we sold some moon dog shirts we sold some uswa podcast stickers and some things like that so mike miller uh we haven't sold any mike miller stuff that hurts my feelings Aww. uh we did sell a couple of those buttons at the uh at the <laughs> fan fest in uh, jonesboro because rosie was wearing wearing a button She's like, who the hell is this guy? I was like, that's me, Mike Miller. You better recognize. So she's like, all right, fine. She, so she put it on and we sold a couple. So that was cool. Uh, <laughs> if you have any questions, comments, uh, requests uh, related to the show, you can email us at uswapodcast at outlook.com. If you'd like to do an ad swap with us or something like that, just let me know. We'll see what we can do about that. And make sure you follow wrestlecopia.com and all the great podcasts that ray russell has over there including his patreon where just five dollars a month will get you a ton of amazing content and of course get ready for dangerous conversations with doug gilbert my weekly podcast with doug gilbert that's starting up real soon and for everything related to it and doug's uh social medias and his t-shirt store all that good stuff you can check that out at doug gilbert podcast.com and if you want to hear more from my co-hosts some uh some wild and crazy <laughs> rants and discussions and all sorts of fun stuff go wherever you listen to the podcast and put in p3 radio just as you see it there on your screen if you're watching if you're listening it's the letter p the number three and the word radio these guys have had a podcast going for years now i applaud their consistency and their dedication to the craft of podcasting. It's always fun. It's always entertaining. And uh, if you think they say some wild shit here, you haven't heard anything. <laughs> Go check out their podcast where they're unfiltered and uh, they don't hold back. It's a lot of fun. Uh, they, they've had guests. They talk about just everything. It's not just wrestling. It's, it's a little bit of everything. So make sure you, you check that out. Guys, anything else before we sign off? Two weeks ago was a humdinger, as they say. <laughs> but yeah, uh, we we are enjoying this thing, man. We're we're glad that people out there are enjoying this, and can't wait to see next week's episode. We're going to be marching into March, right? That's right. We will be into March, and we will have a new middleweight champion. I can only imagine the amount of shit J.C. Ice is going to be talking as he marches into that studio wearing the middleweight title. Uh, and Jeff Jarrett's going to be wearing the Southern heavyweight title. So Brian Christopher is not going to be happy. And the moon dogs, uh, are going to have a ball headed manager named Richard Lee. So, uh, and you know, every week WWF has been sending in a superstar. So we have to figure somebody is going to be showing up. Who could it be? You'll just have to tune in to find out right here on the Retro Wrestling Review Podcast.